Hello again, I'm Phil Liggett. It's always nice to have you along, especially when we're going to show you one of the world's most underrated bike races between Ghent and Wavelgum. You know, the Belgians are very proud of this race, and over the last few years they've changed the course. So it goes out into France, it goes over Mont Cassel, and that's a small climb in France that sees many of the region's big races go over it, like the four days of Dunkirk, for example. Well, this year, Ghent Wavelgum, the 51st running of the event, was an absolute cracker, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's go to the start now and begin by meeting the riders. Guido Von Tempi, the evergreen of Italian cycling, riding for the Gay Viz team, the man who's won this race on two occasions. Mario Cipollini, the winner in 1992 and 1993. And the men who might win it this time, Andre Schmil, last year's winner of the Paris Bay. This is Johan Capio. Never won this race, but did finish second to Cipollini back in 1992. Johan Museu, the winner of the Tour of Flanders, and now hoping to add Ghent Wevelgem. The rollout traditionally being made from Kuipke, the Ghent Velodrome, and the riders now facing 16 climbs around the bergs of Flanders, a brief incursion into France, Two climbs of the Kemmelberg, and this is what happened on the first climb earlier today. It's a very steep cobble climb with a tricky descent, but thankfully the weather is fine. Maximum gradients of 20% with an average gradient of 13%. But surprisingly, there's hardly been an attack all day. The riders having kept themselves neatly together until the hills start coming in very quick succession. And the main field haven't really turned a pedal in anger on the long journey away from the velodrome. Well, so often that this has been an event in the early years won by Belgium, but in recent years, Belgium have not had the results that they would like. Mario Cipollini at the front of the group there. Second in 1991, winner 92 and 93. Last year's winner was a Belgian, Wilfred Peters. He's riding today. He beat Franco Ballerini and Johan Museu over the 210 kilometres. It's just three kilometres shorter this year at 207. But the field struggling to maintain the togetherness of the race over these early hours. over the top and on the way down the Kemmelberg. It doesn't look like it with this shot, but in fact they are descending on cobblestones, which are very, very greasy in the wet. One in five or 20% descent here. And it's a matter of uh, just hang on and be rattled to death on the way down. Now we rejoin the race here, 59 kilometers from the finish and the attacks have at last started. And it now looks as though it's going to develop into quite a race. There's a breakaway now of eight riders forming down below. And this breaker going clear on the approach to the Monte Chat, 154 kilometers into the race. And in this breakaway, we've got Dmitry Konishev for the AKI team, Franz Massen for Novell, Marco Seppellini from Lampre, Andre Taffy from Mappe, Nico Verhoeven from the small Palmans team, Bert Dietz of the Telecom team, Felici Puttini, the Swiss national champion from the Refan team, and Denis Zanetta from AKI. That's the breakaway, and now we can have a look at them. There's Dietz, and there's the list I've just given you, with Puttini, the Swiss champion, at the bottom of the list of leaders here. Well, the man who must be considered, or men who must be considered dangerous here, Konishev, Dmitry Konishev, the first Russian rider to really penetrate world cycling as a professional. Franz Massen from Novell, winner of the Amstel Gold Race, and a rider who is steadily riding himself into form. They're the two dangerous men in this breakaway, but the main field are far from out of contention at the moment. Bert Dietz, no wins to his credit last year as a professional, but never short of aggression, this young German rider. And just into our picture there is Nico Verhoeven, he used to have a place on the Dutch PDM team, and now we're getting into his twilight region as a rider and on the small team this year. But nonetheless, 
finding his way into the breakaway in Ghent Wevelgem. There's little Dietz. Former top German amateur rider. I used to see him ride all around the world as an amateur, now settling in nicely as a professional. Andrea Taffy, first saw him come to the prominence with a victory in a stage of the Tour of Americas. There's the Swiss champion, Putini. The Lamprey rider, Serpolini, going through. He was the youngest rider to take part in the Tour de France last year. And although he didn't make it, he did distinguish himself in a breakaway there. It seems that everybody pulling the weight at the moment in this front group. Let's have a look at the back group. Off on the far right there, Mario Cipollini keeping the tempo nice and high. A rider who always seems to do well in Ghent Wevelgem. He's crossed swords a few times in this race with uh, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov. Brian Holm off to the right, and in the blue of Team Motorola, we've got Sean Yates, the animal, fighting his way through to the front again. But once more, the field regrouping behind that leading group of eight men. They're well aware that the back end of this course is a difficult one, and providing that break of eight doesn't get too far away, then they should have a chance of winding it in as we go into the last hour of the race. Looks as though the teams of Mercatoni Uno are going to keep this chase up hard here because they don't have a man in that front group. Their man is in this main group and we're calling the lead group the Konishev group and that's 45 seconds up now. Mercatoni Uno, I would imagine they're going to put all their men at the front to try and keep Cipollini in with a shout here. It's Cipollini, the great Italian sprinter seems to have found his form again this year as he so often does at the start of the season three stage victories in the tour of the Mediterranean for Cipollini he's already had seven wins uh, this year another one of the small climbs this is climb number 13 of the 16 climbs so four climbs to go Putini sitting at the back this is Nico Verhoeven they still have a nice workmanlike group here. Verhoeven waiting, in fact, for the rider behind there to come through. And that was uh, Zanet, Zanetta, who wasn't coming through. Uh, this is Calcaterra on the Mercatoni Uno team, doing a nice strong turn to try and drag this peloton back into contention. Brian Holm is not going to offer any help because his teammates up front, Bern Dietz, Bart Dietz rather, So they're going to leave all of the work to the Mercatoni Uno rider. Calcaterra, a very, very strong man indeed. We can expect to see him in the Tour de France again this year. No big results for him yet this season. The great thing about racing in Flanders is the hotbed of world cycling, these narrow roads that twist and turn. The scenery is not always attractive, but somehow it always emits the magic of world cycling. Serpolini from Lamprey, being joined there by Franz Massen. Then Putini. 46 seconds. It's hardly a, a rip roaring breakaway, is it? It's added just one second to its advantage. But they are working together, and that's a good sign. Taffy willing to go through now and stoke up the uh, pace a little bit. Putini takes a quick drink. Dietz goes through, followed by Verhoeven. Breakaway looking good. Connie Shev and his teammate here, too, in Zanetti. AKI are doing well, with two riders in this lead breakaway. And now, as our helicopter, the police helicopter hovers below our helicopter, which brings you these pictures, we can now see the sort of pace they're going. Downhill, a 9% descent. And they're even managing to change places at the front with Connie Shev and uh, Zanetta going downhill as well. Serpolini, Lamprey. Their team leader, Maurizio Fondria, still in that chase group. They were, in fact, on the start line this morning. 25 teams, a very good entry indeed for Ghent Wevelgem for the 51st running of it. And uh, each team allowed a maximum of eight men. Not every team providing eight men. Depends how they're feeling, because uh, they're thinking uh, very seriously now of the upcoming Paris-Roubaix after the Tour of Flanders. 
the weather not quite the April weather we've experienced in the past in Belgium. It's usually a very cold day and it can be either snowing or certainly raining. Spring is very, very kind this year. Good roads at the moment. Race will shortly go into France briefly. 51 seconds. The workman light group is making headway. Nobody is shirking the turn at the front. And a very, very depressing Flanders Road indeed, unless you're in the breakaway and just about out of sight. There's the main field, so we're looking back just on the minute. Although the head of the race is nice and compact, judging by the line out of the back of that peloton, they are in fact going at quite a speed. 55 kilometers to the finish, 162 in the bank. Now we can go down and see just what's going on. It looks again as though Mercatoni Uno are gonna have to take up the pace. And a lot of yellow jerseys now coming to the fore of Mercatoni. The hill's always short and sharp, but they're good enough to hurt the legs, even of these cyclists, at the speed they go. We're heading now for Mont Noir, the Black Mountain. That's three and a half kilometers away. There is nobody here now, it seems, willing to help Mercatoni. We had the lotto riders in the action early on, but they appear to have dropped out of it. Lotto with their top man in there, Andre Schmil. And Marc Sejon, Herman Frieson, of course. Uh, Frieson, who won this race a few years ago, back in 1990. Back up with the leaders. Franz Massen on the right of our picture, number 93. Until he retired in the Tour de France last year, Franz Massen had never retired in a bike race in his life as a professional. That is a tremendous achievement. He was heartbroken when he had to pull out of the Tour de France last summer, and it was the first time he had ever abandoned a race. That says a lot for the courage of the man. Ser Polini, a young rider, but now beginning to show his true strength. It takes a couple of seasons. Zanetta, through and off. This is Nico Verhoeven. There goes Marsen. And Zanette going through as well. This looks like uh, Taffy is finding the going a little bit tough just at the minute. Sitting, although his face doesn't seem to think so, maybe he's just uh, shirking a turn at the front. Maybe. Mappe have told him not to do any more work now because the break isn't going to go anywhere. Or maybe there'll be a counter-attack from Mappe coming up. Mappe have last year's winner on their team. Carries number one today, Wilfred Peters. And they have a tremendously strong team, as always, especially with Johan Museu back there, the winner of the Tour of Flanders a few days ago. Swiss champion, we don't see too much of him in action, but anyway, he's doing his bit at the front at the moment. Well, there's no real uh, indication as to where the wind is blowing from the pattern of the riding here. The riders don't seem to be forming any echelons against the wind. The wind isn't too strong. The same can be said about the main field, too, because they, they are packing and there's no organisation. The fact is that Cipollini's team are having to drag this race along because Cipollini's the danger sprinter and he hasn't placed a man in that breakaway. And a little bit of misting on the picture. Don't adjust your TVs. That's the exhaust from our helicopter that's coming out over the camera lens. So Mercatoni Uno, Michele Bartoli, Calcaterra and uh, Cipollini are the main men down there, helped by Roberto Petito and Eros Poli and Casagrande, Francesco Casagrande. That's a rider a lot of people are talking about this year, Casagrande as to be the big improver of the season, we'll see. Seven wins already, Cipollini. He may be going into his spring rest period, who knows? But anyway, I'm sure he'll change his attitude if the team manages to close this gap before the finish. They've still got the final climb to come of the Kemmelberg. And then over the top of that, it's uh, head down and go for home. A 
looking down from the helicopter, we've got four or five or maybe even six riders down there from Mercatoni Uno. With the other riders uh, taking full advantage of the team tactics of which they are well aware. Now let's go down there again because it looks as though Lotto have come to give them a hand. Hermann Frison, previous winner five years ago here as we start the climb of Mont Noir. And a good piece of pacemaking being done up the climb as well. Roberto Petito, Iros Poli was setting the pace. Big high gear tempo climbing by the whole field here. Sean Yates will enjoy that as he starts to dodge through the peloton there. Holding at 54 seconds. Iros Poli just going off our camera to the right. He was the great rider that put up that wonderful breakaway, a total non-climber. When he went over the top of Mont Ventoux is such a lead, they couldn't catch him before the finishing Carpentras in the Tour de France last year. Very popular victory indeed. And Eros Poli, a medalist in the Olympic Games a few years back, just before he turned pro. Well, just about everybody out of the saddle on the climb in the Mont Noir. But the gears, they're turning, probably 53-15 by the look at the pedalling rate. Now, Lamprey riders also coming up. That doesn't say a lot of confidence uh, for Ser Pellini in the breakaway. But, of course, this is Maurizio Fondriest here on our far left. And Fondriest monitoring just about everybody. Second in Milan-San Remo this year. Former world champion, like Lance Armstrong, won the world title at the very early stage of his career. Then had a dip, but now has come back to be one of the great riders. And the tail of the peloton now finding that uh, they haven't all done the same amount of kilometres in training this year. Few riders losing contact. Frison is the rider doing the damage. Wilfred Nellison trying to come through in the black jersey there. Champion of Belgium. Well, Frison's been around a long time now. He pops up with the odd good ride all of the time. And it was certainly a great day for him back in 1990 when he finished ahead of Johan Museo and Peter Winnen. Winnen now retired, Museo far from it, and Frison can't go on much longer, I wouldn't have thought. And the tail of the peloton just about getting themselves back into contention now. Following up from the peloton to just about one minute to the leaders. They still have a very, very good lead here. Dmitry Konishev, who has won stages of the Tour de France. He took his medal, came to the fore, and he took a medal in the World Championships in Chambéry. He's had one or two unlucky team signings over the years, but he seems to be happy now. He's joined the AKI Gepemi uh, squad in Italy, and uh, there was a glimpse of Konishev, number 56. Just on 31 miles to go, just about 30 miles, 49 kilometers to go to the finish. Climb number 15, the Bannerberg. So there's this climb to come, and then the climb of the Kemmelberg itself. And they haven't, for my money, got a big enough advantage to survive both of these climbs unless something really happens and that breakaway does get down to some hard work. They're still working well together. Franz Marsen or Dmitry Konishev, the type of riders who will try to go alone, perhaps, on the climb of the Kemmelberg. I feel Puttini is probably at his at full pressure here, so too Taffy. Nika Verhoeven could spring a surprise. There's Puttini sitting at the back now, the champion of Switzerland. Three riders from Italy. One from Russia and a couple from Holland. And Putini there, I think, went round the corner in a little bit the wrong gear. And now he's going to have to work hard to get it rolling again because the road has gone slightly uphill. There's big Franz Massen. 
and looks nicely relaxed. I bet he regrets the day he allowed Lance Armstrong to ride to victory in Harmer in Norway in 1993. He was with him when he went, then he dropped off. He thought, in fact, that Miguel Indurain was going to come up and he waited for Miguel Indurain. Well, Lance Armstrong on that occasion waited for no one and won the world title. And Masson, had he come down to the sprint, might well have taken it. Taffy working very hard. Total concentration there on the face of the Italian. Spring just about bursting. Still no real passengers. Maybe there are some not doing perhaps the heavy turns of others, but there's no real passenger here. Onto the slopes of the Bannerberg. Konishev, a little Dietz. Then Nico Verhoeven. Going through very strongly. Masson knows him well. He follows him through. Now problems could happen here. The road is very, very narrow. And there are the lead police bikes. And there is a rider down there. And the main field is coming back very, very quickly. And this rider here... Well, this is Frank Hoy. Now, Frank is a new professional from Denmark. I remember him winning a stage of the British milk race two years ago when it finished down in the south of England. And the Danes had a tremendous team that year. He was a teammate of Lars Mikkelsen, who is also riding this race today. Mikkelsen turning pro last year and shocking everybody by winning his first race from memory. And now he's got seven wins under his belt. He's somewhere in that big field right now. And the Lotto seem to have a little bit of control again. I think that is still Frison on the front. And Mercatoni Uno having to send forward team captain now, Mario Cipollini. It's the best place to be on these narrow roads. There's George Hincapi to the far right of our picture, Steve Bauer in the centre, both Motorola riders. But if you have any ambition at this stage of the race, you've got to hold... There's Cipollini here, so it wasn't Cipollini in the lead. Cipollini's just there. You've got to hold a place near the front now because the roads are so narrow. And a fall in the middle will cut this peloton in half and you probably won't get back at this stage of the race. So the strong men, the likely winners, are probably in the front half of this peloton or indeed in that breakaway right now. A little bit of a better idea just how steep these short climbs are from that angle from the helicopter because they're not long, but they are steep. There's Frank Hoy. And there you can see uh, the legs. You can almost feel his legs aching, can't you, as he goes over the top of the Bannerberg. And the cheers coming in French now, although we are in Belgium just at this point. We're right on the French frontier. And just look now how the steepness of the climb is causing the distress at the back here. Now this is when the race commissaires, the referees, get a little bit divorced from the action because the peloton is now spread over five or six hundred metres. And the sad thing is a rider having trouble at this stage of the race waits a long time for repairs. 45 seconds to Hoy, a minute and three seconds to the main field. It's not a lot, and we've still got the Kemmelberg to come. Andrea Taffe. Going past Dmitry Konishev, Franz Marsen coming through, having a look at Taffe, Nico Verhoeven. In fact, these riders are talking to each other at the moment. Well, there's going to be a variety of languages out there. I think Konishev speaks Italian, but I'm sure there's nobody in this race lead speaks Russian. And Zanet is saying here with our graphics from Belgian television has been dropped by the league group. So Zanet is the first rider to crack. So that means that Konishev has lost his teammate. The AKI Jipemi. Serpolini just near the back. Putini has now been forced into the role of a follower, the champion of Switzerland. He stopped going through. And this is another wide, straight boulevard through the trees, the sort of road that they don't want now because it means the main field are going to catch glimpses of them. And it looks as though Putini is in a little bit of bother now too. He looked over his shoulder to say, 
uh, what happened to the eighth man in this breakaway. And now he could be the next one to lose here. Taffe is beginning to motor, so too Sir Polini. A quick drink for Franz Masson, never afraid to work, Franz. He's a nice rider, Marco Serpolini. Sits there, looks good, looks very confident. He's, he's really grown in stature since uh, his season last year. He's certainly got the man to tell him how to do it in Maurizio Fondriest. Now, this break has got themselves sorted out now. They're working very well together. Even Putini has started to go through. There's Verhoeven. He's looking for the wheel of Masson. Dietz taking a look over his shoulder to see if there's anybody coming up. No sign of Frank Hoy yet. Connie Shev. And there's the revision now. We just have the seven riders left in the lead. And this is Frank Hoy, so he hasn't been caught then. Frank is still st staying out there and holding his own at the moment. He signed for the Belgian Kolstrop team. And just 43 kilometres to go, and the main field has got them all pegged down, I think. This is them. The main field here is very much under pressure now. That looks like Giuseppe Calcaterra leading again for Mercatoni Uno. And also the Motorola boys can smell the end here. The kill is on, because you've got Bauer and Yates, the two strong men of Motorola. And now there are a lot of riders willing to come through now. It looks as though that either Refan that was, or indeed Lotto, who's also moved up through the ranks. So a lot of fluid movement in the main field now. They've picked up for the moment at least a tailwind on a very good stretch of road. And you can see by the speed of the peloton that this is going to reshape the race. Frank Hoy, I think, may as well throw in the towel, and there's the reason why, because they've come back to him very, very quickly indeed, and it's Lotto who is now going to the front. So this is Lotto, and this is little Nico Martin, who briefly held the race lead in the Tour of Great Britain milk race a couple of years ago before he turned pro, and from memory, I think he finished ninth overall when he rode for the Belgian national team. Now he's a pro with the Belgian team Lotto, managed by Jean-Luc van den Broek, former junior world track champion, amongst many other things, of course, before he retired. So Nico Martin, the split that always looks spectacular from a helicopter, and there it is, and they all race down both sides of the highway and merge back together again. But they're absolutely flying now. That breakaway, I'm sure, has got to be doomed at this stage. Calcaterra takes up the running again for the Mercatoni Uno. They can smell now that the hard work hasn't been wasted. Heading towards the Kemmelberg. The last of the 16 climbs today. Four and a half kilometers. Bauer goes through. Nico Martin on his wheel. And they're both on the wheel of Mercatoni Uno. And it looks like it's still Calcaterra there. Well, Nico looks very, very good. You can see he's a very young man. There's Guido Bontempi just behind him. Bontempi, the winner of this race back in 1986. A long and very, very colourful career for Guido Bontempi. I think he's won ten stages in his home tour, the Tour of Italy. He's won stages too and led the Tour de France. And there we are, heading for Wavelgum now, and just the one climb still to come. Number 16. Well, a little checkered flag there won't come soon enough for the breakaway, because look, the Lamprey riders are also chasing now. They decided that Serpolini's chances are slim, and they want Fondrias to be up in at the kill. Whenever there's a gap in the peloton now, there's a new flurry of riders trying to get through to the front. They're all racing, and uh, this is a, always true of a race in Belgium, and I used to race in Belgium as well, that when you ride the Kemmelberg, the race really goes so quickly for the 30 kilometers leading up to the mountain. It's a narrow climb, and only the strong men can get there first, because in the bunch, the best men will make the front. 
Hermann Frieson still at the front. Calcaterra coming through, never afraid to do a little bit of duty. Neither is Steve Bauer on the right here, enjoying every minute of it today, Steve Bauer. He really does look sharp this year. But into the village of Kemmel, so the Berg is not very far away for the breakaway. They'll have the advantage of seeing it first. The crowd will be behind the barriers. In my day, they were all over the road. You used to finish up in a ditch and they'd pick you up without you even getting off your bike. Franz Marsen. Little mistake by Poutine. He's put himself on the wrong side of the road there and lost the wheels. But here's the right-hand turn. So take them away and up towards the Kemmel. Poutini's tacked on to the tail. And just 38 kilometers to go now. Inside, 25 miles to the finish. Dietz again has been a strong man in this breakaway. An enormous amount of strength, this young German rider. That's uh, probably because of all the years he's spent on the training squad of the national German team, who really do know how to train their amateur riders. Italian Taffy clearly feeling the chill air even though it is quite pleasant in Belgium but he comes from an even warmer country in Italy whereas Belgium probably feels pretty warm to Nico Verhoeven in the front here because Holland has had a little bit more bad weather than Belgium this year Holland and the flat lands and the dikes can be very exposed especially in the driving rain and Verhoeven is setting the pace but it looks as though it's Taffy setting the pace in the breakaway here Marsen looks good. Frutini looks a little bit more concerned with the way things are going. So too does uh, Dietz here. Konishev. And Serpolini. Well, I wonder if he knows his team is chasing him. Verhoeven has come back into the group. Now, Sir Polini's got himself on the front as we start up towards the Kemmelberg. Not overdoing it. The motorcyclist on the left, I think, has just shown them a time gap, so they'll know they're pretty close. But at least they're going to get the first run at the mountain, the cobbles, for the second time. This is still in the main field now, and they're also on the climb. Fondriest is about three riders down from this group. The Mape riders also working at the front now. Very difficult to control the race at this stage on the last climb. If they do slow down at the front, then they'll get swamped by the riders behind, which is what they don't want, and that is to lose their position at the head of the race. Because on this narrow climb, they will have a real job to get back. Sean Yates climbing in second place. Yates on the far left. It looks as though Andre Schmill has found his way up here in the middle there, wiping his nose too. Winner of last year's Paddy Roubaix. And for a while led the World Cup until it was uh, taken out with a great flurry of results by Gianluca Bortolami who incidentally is riding in this race, although I must confess I haven't seen too much of him today. Now this is the turn onto the Kemmelberg. The mountain that lies at the top of our picture there, you caught a glimpse of briefly. There's this gradient, 19% at the top. Two and a half kilometers to the top of the climb. And in fact, the main field are not far off making that left turn right now. So they have closed in quite quickly. And unfortunately, 
For the leaders, the finish isn't just over the top, there's still a fair way to go. It looks as though Dietz is going to be the first rider to suffer on the gradients. It's down to 35 seconds now as Dietz begins to crack just that little bit. He's got the cobble section yet to come. And Nico Verhoeven also is finding that the second climb of the Kemmelberg is not going to be too good for him. Serpolini is also dropping, so is Patini, the man doing the damage. I'm not surprised about this, is Dmitry Konishev. Turned pro back in 1989 after winning the Amateur Tour of Italy. And then straight away took the silver medal in the World Championships at Chambéry. Much of the disgust of Sean Kelly who finished third. And the happiness of Greg LeMond who won it. And on to the climb now. This is where I think Konishev will try to go alone if he's going to survive. And hope that the distraction of the others being caught will turn the main field off. Konishev on the climb. Andrea Taffy trying to get up into second place. And Franz Massen, look at his teeth, he's just gritting his teeth. But over the top, Konishev, not a great lead. Taffy coming over now, should get on on the descent. And Massen too, but those three, I think, are going to go clear. It's Puttini, yes, it is Puttini, just behind the motorcycle. This is Serpolini and Dietz. They haven't lost a lot of time on that climb. There's still a chance they could regroup. But a little bit of concern, I think, for the following vehicles because that's why the main field is right behind them. Fondriest is the man doing the damage now, and Cipollini is there too, gritting his teeth. And in fact, back in the group is Nico Verhoeven. He's got dropped into the main field. Wilfred Nellison goes through and over the summit. These are the riders now who still feel they have a chance. This is Guido Bontempi too, and the gap officially is 21 seconds. Bauer is here. Little Steve Bauer very much in contention. So too on the far right, Sean Yates. In the centre picture was Gianluca Bortolami. Lars Mikkelsen going through there in the centre of our picture as well. Well, judging by the look on some of these riders' faces, they're rather pleased they're over the top. George Hincapi going through. None of these riders must be considered to be out of this race now with only 21 seconds the spread. If they reorganise once they're over the top of this climb, we could yet see a bunch finish here. Now the tricky descent off the Kemmelberg. And our motorcyclists are the brave souls who have to sort it all out for us. Yes, that's Taffy just in front of us, Connie Sheva Masson. So they're saying that the three of them have got it together right in front of us here. Taffy is the one nearest, I think. And Reed, this is Patini, I think it's the Swiss rider here. So we're still probably going to move forward a little bit. This is Patini, the Swiss rider. He hasn't contacted the leaders. We're now trying to work our way through very difficult conditions on these narrow roads. There is Franz Maaßen. And the breakaway has exploded on that climb. They had no choice whatsoever. There's Taffy. So these are the three leaders. Konishev, that's the man doing all of the damage. He looks very, very different with that crash helmet on, I must confess. But you can't mistake his style. Dmitry Konishev had some great moments uh, when he won two stages in the Tour de France back in 1991, including the last stage on the, uh, on the Champs-Élysées. But there's a rider there making Putini really did push that to the limit, didn't he? Trying desperately to keep up with everybody, but he almost lost it. Now, can they get onto the back wheel of Konishev? It looks as though they will. This is going to give us four leaders. And f I'm absolutely amazed that indeed uh, Felici Puttini is staying with the action here, but he is, and hats off to him. Now it's the real chase across the Flanders countryside that has made Belgian cycling so wonderful. The hills are behind, but the sound of music is still a little way away for these four. And Konichev, to me, looks as though he is going away from this team time trial. Ended his season on a high note last year, not only with a fifth in the World Championship, but a fourth in the Tour of Lombardy, the Italian classic. Now trying to refine that form. I think he's found it. Konishev uh, 
deciding that he'd better wait for these three. There's no point in trying to hold them off. He may as well work with them. As we look down the road, there is the rest of the race because the breakaway has been blown up. This is now a new group, I would say, coming from the main field. Some five riders completely disintegrated the main field is as well. And this is the most interesting move. There's Cipollini looking over his shoulder. They could carry the sprinter up and he could win this for a third time. If Cipollini does manage to get up there, Bert Dietz, he's going the wrong way. He's coming back from the breakaway, but he's got himself an express train here. I think Maurizio Fondres is in this move as well. So Cipollini in the yellow, the hard work of the Mercatoni Uno team to keep this race in touch has not been to no avail. Now Cipollini knows it's all down to him. There is Fondriest. Dietz. And there's more riders coming from the back. Well, it's not just uh, being a good sprinter that matters at pro level. You've got to be a good workhorse as well, because Cipollini's having to do a lot of work here. And number three is Franco Ballerini. Now there's a man to conjure with. He's made the split. The great place getter in the world's classics. He's now making another move for a top shot. Well, he's yet to make a top three finish in the Gemp Wave or Gun Ballerini. So why not start today? There's Dieter. Johan Museo. Oh, the cream has arrived now. Museo has got here as well. So the Mappe have got the men up. Lamprey have got the men up. Mercatoni Uno has got the man up they want. They've still got to catch these four, but it's only a matter of time, I think. They did it all right, it just didn't work. They decided they were right to break that break up on the climb of the Kemmelberg and try for it. But the main field just got that little bit too excited and they sent up the big guns. So it looks to me as though Gent Wavergun by the end of the day will have notched another top name as a winner. There's no lucky winners of this race. If you go through the winners list over the years, Sean Kelly, Frizon, Abdu Japarov, Cipollini, Jan Ras, those are the men, Eric van der Aarden, they've all won this race. And there is Wilfred Nellison flying the flag well for his home and for the fact he is the reigning champion of Belgium too. Guido Bontempi, he's also here for the gave his team. So we've got certainly two previous winners in this front group, in Bontempi and uh, Cipollini. But I think we're about to witness the capture. Sir Polini refuses to give up, but he may as well because they're on the back wheel now of Masson and Konishev. And Sir Polini knows it. He won't be too disappointed because the rider he wants to see up here is here, Maurizio Fondriest. And you never know, Mauricio might just pass a word of encouragement across to Marco Seppellini, something like, well done. And more attacks coming again from Mappe this time. Cipollini goes through the line. He's still good looking even when he's under pressure. He just sits there, tries to make it look easy, but of course it isn't. Now we're going to see a marvellous last few kilometres of this race because they've come together at the front, the strong men, and they won't want it to come through all the way to the end like this. It's simply too many riders here. The motorbikes, I must say, are getting a little bit in the way of this lead group as they try to get it together again, because that's the second group, and that's the remnants of the peloton coming through. I don't know how many's in that group, but it's going to make contact with these seven front runners very, very shortly. There's uh, Banco Ballolini sitting at the back. Just watching the moves for the moment, at least. And there's Gianluca Bortolami. 
his teammates. Maurizio Fondrius riding very near the front and with 26 kilometers to go, almost 27, you can see there's quite a large peloton making contact. So the pack is going to be reshuffled again. And just look at the speed of that chase as well. So the Kemmelberg today did not have the final say and it really did at one time look as though it was on. A good combination of great riders got to the front but for some reason, this big field has fought its way back. And it hasn't been an easy chase either. Three riders getting there first. A little bit of extra energy they might regret, because the main field is going to get on anyway. A dozen riders at the front. Soon to be, I would think, it looks to me, around about 40 riders now contacting the lead. Bowers made it too. Constant pressure, there's no relaxation. This is going to stay in a long, thin line. Sean Yates there. So although they've made contact, there is no sign of the pace easing up at all. And that's a sign the elastic will snap again very, very shortly. Looks to me as though setting the pace there was Andrea Taffy. That is a remarkable piece of riding by Taffy. There he is, he's pacing, in fact, Fondriest. And Taffy is a much improved rider. As is all of anybody that seems to join the Mappe squad, always finds their legs as a cyclist. And right now, I think Taffy would like our camera to get out of the way because he can't go by. And I think uh, perhaps the referees have just told our cameraman in his radio to move clear of the race because he's gone. And Taffy here keeping the, pen, keeping the pace high in the hope that perhaps Portolami or Ballerini or indeed Museo can take advantage later. Taffy just about ready to swing off there now, the 28-year-old had had that great ride on the lone breakaway he made in the Tour of Flanders a few days ago. He's certainly not afraid of working hard. Only a couple of wins last year, but what a good team rider he is. And this is a big bunch, but every one of these riders in this lead bunch have all had to work very, very hard to get up here. Now you can see the complete size of it. 30, 35 riders, no more. So this is where the strength this year in Gent-Wavergum lies. Everybody had the chance to get here, but only the best made it. And it looks as though we've got uh, the Nobel boys coming back to the front now. This is Marsen again. So he's been in the breakaway and he's still got the strength to continue to race. And Nico Verhoeven. Keeping the pace nice and steady. 23 kilometers to go. And that's just around about 15 miles of racing left, so something like 35, 40 minutes still to go. A little tempter there, it looked like a, a ref and rider who went clear. And nobody has counted the move, so they haven't rated him very much. We'll go and have a look who he is. Good place to go when you get into the streets of a town because you get out of sight very quickly. Masson not reacting. Well, now we really have got a good little piece of reaction coming on now. This is Alessandro Bertolini. And now the pack is going to shuffle itself again, I think, because the action has started once more. Riders begin, beginning to scramble here as they cross the gap. Nicola Loder going through there. The rider who didn't quite make it, looking for the wheel there, was Joe Plankett. There he is, he's got his wheel. And straight away, a workmanlike group is settling in. Although I think 
But if we were to look around the back, I think the whole line has got on here. So the field has reformed after that attack. Big slabs of concrete on the Belgian highway here. And then all of a sudden you're on cobblestone. That's very typically Belgian cycling. We look into the tunnel and there we see the riders. I think the other rider in fact was a club cyclist. He wasn't involved in the race. This is the group now. No reduction in speed for well over two hours. The pressure has stayed on. It's going to be a quick uh, game. Where have we gone this? Mind you, I think our motorcycle uh, camera bike there is proving to be quite a carrot for these riders. They keep on chasing down the bike. And so the pace is staying high. Andre Schmill going through and looking a little bit the worse for wear. Joe Plankett. And that's Taffy again in the thick of the action. This rider here, Stefano Zanata. He's having a good start to his year, but then immediately now we have an attack. Taffy trying to chase down. And once again, the strong one's trying to form a winning breakaway. One of them is bound to work. It's only a question of knowing which one to go for, because you don't get too many shots. Well, the wind coming from the right. And Taffy is getting himself mixed up into the action again. And there's the man who started all of the trouble there, Andre Schmiel. He was the one that launched the attack. But I don't think the two riders who got with him can do much about it. Luke Rusen is the rider in yellow, and there's Taffy. Lou Cruson, well, he's a useful rider. Turned pro back in 1986. And straight away won a stage of the Dauphiné that year. And occasionally he throws in a good classic ride. He had a sixth place in Liege Baston Liege back in 1988. He's been runner up in the Amstel Gold Race. It was a real good sprint that in 1990. But he hasn't had a win now, to my knowledge, since 1991. But he's pushing the pace a little bit right now. Finding themselves a little bit of a smooth road there, but one rider deciding the cobbles aren't so bad after all. So a workmanlike group of about 12 men has got away from the front of the pack. A very strong turn though on the front of that pack by Edric van Hooydonk. Telecom holding second place, and uh, in fact, that rider is Eric Zabel, who established himself with a classic victory towards the end of last year. Nelson just passing through. Number 14 there is Nicola Loda. Lars Mikkelsen on the left of our picture now is trying to move up to the front here. First time we've seen him in the action this year, as far as I can remember. But he had a great start to his pro career last year with seven wins. Now the hounds chasing the hares because there isn't much there, but they're going so quickly over these last uh, two or three hours that the I think they're all flat out, and the chances of them clawing this break back 
must be seen as slim. It is going to be a difficult pursuit this and there will need to be a lot of help coming their way. Lou Krusen keeping the pressure on. Lars Mikkelsen. Best remembered, I suppose, that sensational crash uh, in the Amateur World Championships in Harma in Norway, just on the finishing line. He sort of went on the side by the barriers and uh, flew through the air. He never actually crossed the finishing line. Happily, he's fine. So, the old hand with the new hand, trying to get away now from the rest of the race here in Gent Wavergum. Well, I said earlier, you don't get many surprise winners. But Lars Mikkelsen, I think, if he were to hold on to this, would be a surprise. Lou Krusen, well, he's done it before. Not here in Gent Wavergum, but he has been a winner. He hasn't won a race for the best part of four seasons. And we're just now 19 kilometers from the finish. And the main chase group is having to replan their strategy. And the Novell team continue to force the pace yet again. Van Hoydonk taking them through. Steve Bauer always at or near the front. And must still be feeling confident because that breakaway you can see is only literally just on the horizon. And Rusen and Mikkelsen, the teams are not all that strong. They'll have a job to control. I don't even know how many teammates they have left in this league group anyway. But it won't be easy for them to control the chase. Lars was on the great Danish team that went to Barcelona. In fact, he finished 11th in the Olympic Games there. And Frank Hoy was another member of that team who's now a professional in this race today. We've already seen him on the attack. The Danes have got some very strong riders and uh, the sport in Denmark is on a high right now with massive television coverage. And they have about 12 top pros on the European circuit. Now it looks as though they've got themselves another one here. Really looking very, very good indeed here. 26 years of age, Mikkelsen. Lives in Paris during the cycling season. And he comes from Copenhagen. And they're swapping turns well. Luke Rusen, 30 years of age and a pro for nine seasons. Well, Novell clearly have an interest in this. Very much so indeed. Zimaldi Nabdu Japarov is their man and there he is, number 91. And the 16 second time gap. Even uh, Abdu Japarov seems to be willing to work in the chase. And a counter-attack going, and that's Fondriest. So Fondriest trying to move up now. Surely they're not going to let Maurizio Fondriest spri uh, sprint clear. Andre Schmiel certainly is, not he's gone. That's caused the reaction from the Novell riders. Abdu Japarov always willing to let somebody else go through first before he picks up the chase. But nonetheless, he's got in line. And now the conversation goes on. As Schmiel wants somebody else to do the chasing. And this is Joe Plankert, who doesn't seem to have the legs. He's very good at following the wheels, but hasn't got the legs to push home the attacks. And that was Remo Rossi who went for Carrera. This is Steve Bauer. Now, these sort of attacks surely are going to whittle down that lead, which was only 16 seconds anyway. But Fondriest has thrown a real cat among the pigeons now because it was his attack. And Fondrius is not a man to waste his energy. He is such a strong rider, but he waits until he thinks he's got the right moment and goes. So often near the end of a race, he'll put everything into it. There he is, Maurizio Fondriest. And now, can he reach Luke Rusen and Lars Mikkelsen? Well, that looks like Guido Bontempi, and Lecker Bond means he's got a flat back tyre. And that's bad luck for Bontempi, a previous winner. Andre Schmil here. And this race has reorganized itself now at the front. There's Bauer. Johan Museo just sits there watching and waiting, perhaps. Oh, and Bauer's unsighted. Bauer's clipped the side of the car and gone down. 
This is Ibinia Spruk of Lamprey who's gone. I think Museo has gone as well. And there is Johan Museo and he's limping pretty badly. Well, this is amazing. The car was parked on the edge of the road there and that is quite often where they are placed in a race like this. But Steve Bauer clearly didn't see it and clipped the side. And down went Maurizio, um, down went his teammate rather, Zbigniew Spruk. And more importantly perhaps for the MAPE team, their big man, Johan Museo, has gone as well. Well, Bauer looks more than a little bit stunned right now, and let's hope he's OK. Let's have a look again at what happened. There you can see Bauer's left shoulder really did hit that car. And taking out immediately Museo and indeed Spruch. And the wreck bike there of Museo is on the right. It looks as though his right knee is hurt. And the elbow which hit the front of the car of Steve Bauer. Well, those sort of crashes are very, very nasty shocks indeed because they are totally unexpected. And what a great shame as well because that uh, move was bringing back the breakaway group and Bauer was on a ride today. So, Museo has clearly hurt his knee but is being helped up. And I wonder what this will do now for his chances for completing the double. He's won the Tour of Flanders, but he was aiming for Roger Vlaminck's record in 1977, which was the double of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. And I wonder if he'll recover in time. And there we have Steve Bauer too. And Bauer indeed looks as though he's OK. That's good news. Back up to the race, which has gone some kilometres down the road after that crash. And Fondrias Roosen and Mikkelsen are still together and dangling off the front of a very, very disrupted chase now. It could well have worked, sadly, in the favour of these three. And Fondrias was the man who reached them on his own. They never got up to him. There's Lars Mikkelsen. He is turning out to be a great new find, this young man. Seven wins after he turned pro last year. And now this will be his first full season as a professional. And here he is in the break in a classic. Putting himself right forward on his saddle, always a sign that they're giving their full effort when they're on the nose of that saddle. The gap is still not significant, but it could be enough. The flat road's now leading us straight into the center of Wevelgum. And there's some idea of the speed between 70 and 80 kilometers an hour, 45 and 50 miles an hour. They are really moving now. And Fondriest checking to see if the pace is worth keeping on and I think they decided it most certainly is because they know at these sort of speeds the chase can't make much progress. Luke Rusen has been in this position before when he won the Amstel Gold, when he was second rather than the Amstel Gold race five years ago. That's Holland's classic, 12 seconds the gap. And we can see the gap in reality now from the helicopter. A long straight road, the chase has reorganized itself and patched itself up after the loss of three riders from it, three strong riders indeed, although Spruck would not have done any chasing once he'd seen Fondrias leave the group, they're on the same team. And Cipollini is still in this chase group and still hoping that they'll come back together again, so too is Abdu Japarov. And there's the Mercatoni Uno boys, throwing it about between themselves, but they're at the back of the group here now. Nelson also freewheeling, and I'm wondering if they've become a little bit depressed by the crash. And that rider looks like Claudio Chiapucci, who's uh, shaking his bike and moving himself a little bit further up the line. And Chiapucci, no doubt, uh, making ready for the Hillier Classics, Flesh Wallon and the Liege Baston Liege. Two riders trying to chip up the front. Big fast turns being done by them as well. Only 13 kilometers to go to the finish now, just over seven miles. And at these sort of speeds, they will be in inside 12 minutes. 12 minutes to defend a 12 second lead for these three riders. And Fondriest doing his share of the pacemaking as well. But I don't think there's a passenger here. They're just doing long, fast turns and holding the pace high. And Fondriest pedaled all the way around that corner.
turned pro back in 1987. And in 1988, he won the World Championship. When you may remember, it was Steve Bauer who had the contretemps with Claudio Criquillion. And ironically, it's Bauer who we've seen crash out of this race again today. And they're just nudging it out, 17 seconds. One has the feeling that this is going to work. And Fondriest will be the finish specialist here. He's taken a good look at Lars Mikkelsen there as he's gone through. Mercatoni Uno riders are now having to tr really try and do something about this breakaway. This is Michele Bartoli here at the back of his teammate. The Lamprey team just closing down on these two riders, keeping them together. And one Mergatoni Uno rider is being allowed to go on here. There's Bert Dietz again coming through for the telecom team. He hasn't gone too far away despite his long breakaway earlier. Now it's the turn of Mikkelsen. Fondriest and Rusen. Rusen that very cramped style. Big strong last Mikkelsen. Looks like he would be a very good pursuit rider. And then a fast turn by Fondriest, 18 seconds still going out, so the big turn by Mikkelsen paid off. It added one second to the lead. This is a long straight approach into Wavelgum. They can see the riders. There's a lot of teammates savagely trying to break up the reaction here. And in fact, that is Zbigniew Spruch, number 46, so he was involved in the crash. He must have remounted immediately and has got back into this lead group. So well ridden there, Spruck is in the pink. And now a counter-attack again from Mercatoni Uno. This is Bartoli, and he's being trailed now by Van Hoydonk. So the Novel riders desperately want this break to come back because they've got their man, Abdu Japarov. Joe Plankert, number 75. And Polti have riders up here as well. And Nelson also up near the front. Vyacheslav Yekimov from Novell. Fine turn of speed to try and keep the action tight here and bring back this breakaway. Well, Yekimov's got the speed. If he can get them up there, it's around about 18 or 19 seconds. Van Hoydonk willing to take up as well. Inside five miles to go now. And there's still two teams willing to work very hard and there's been another crash. There's been another crash, and it looks to me as though that is Sean Yates on the right of our picture who's gone down. So we've lost Bauer, and now we appear to have lost Sean Yates. This really hasn't been the race for Motorola, I'm afraid. Because Yates has gone as well now, though that must have happened somewhere. There it is now at the rear of the bunch, a touch of wheels. You very rarely ever see Sean Yates involved in a crash. And the rider, in fact, uh, just underneath Sean Yates at the moment is Franco Ballerini, who's also gone down. He's holding his shoulder there. So it looks as though Ballerini may well have broken his collarbone in that crash, judging by the way he was lying. So all the drama happens behind the three leaders who continue on towards the finish and hang on to that short lead. Fondriest, Rusens, Mikkelsen, they're not missing a turn. They're working very, very well together. Fondriest, we would expect to be in at the kill. Mikkelsen, less so. And Rusen, well, he hasn't won a race, as I say, for a number of years now. We're not too far away from the finishing wave. Look, now still the Nobel boys are pushing home the pressure. And the reason being, of course, they want to get their sprinter up there. 21 seconds, despite everything, that breakaway is making ground. So the Palti rider working hard there, Giovanni Lombardi, Olympic points champion in Barcelona. And Yekimov is also here. And this is Mario Sierra. So the Palti rider is also willing to go well. Inside six kilometers to go to the finish. The Lamprey riders trying to control that chase a little bit, but I don't think they've got much chance now. It's all down to the effort of these three. And in fact, Rusen has done a tough turn there that made Lars Mikkelsen 
grit his teeth and dig in. This is Mario uh, Shiria again. The big faulty rider doing a very, very strong turn indeed. I can only think that the Palti boys are doing this for either for Danza or Lombardi, because they are the team sprinters. Lombardi is certainly in this league group. I don't know whether for Danza is. And Fondriest always gauging his effort here, just keeping a nice eye on the back to see nobody's creeping up. I think if they came into sight, he would immediately attack. Such a neat rider, and he's happy now. He's gone back on to Italian teams and races again in Italy. Married, and he has uh, one child, Maria. When he turned professional, Fondrias came to the pro ranks with a great reputation as an amateur. He didn't win 100 amateur races, though. He won 99. Mikkelsen matching them wheel for wheel. The new boy amongst the experience. Inside 4K to go. And this are, these are the streets now of Wevelgem. And there is the chase. It's still a very big group indeed. The Mercatoni Uno boys, they just never give up. Pushing the pace once more. Joe Plankard, he's never far away from the front, but he never quite makes the front, Joe. He's hoping to clean up in the sprint, but he's still got three riders who are going to take away all the day's major honours, though, in front of him. Nelson, too, hoping for a high finish. He's a good bunch sprinter. And let's have a look once more. That's a winning gap now for sure. There's no way they're going to close that gap in the remaining two kilometres or so. They don't know it, even if we do. So these three riders have now got to make a decision. How are they going to outwit the other two, as well as outwit the main peloton? They've no time to ease off the gas. They've got to keep the pressure on. They've no choice in this respect. In fact, the gap is starting to close. It's only 15 seconds. So the chase is having its effect, and it might cause a panic here very shortly. It'll have to be very shortly. We're not far away from the kilometer banner. Fondriest would probably like to keep those two in front of him now until it came to the sprint. Rusen can deliver a very good finish indeed. 15 seconds to round about 15 to 20 riders in the chase and all of the pace being done now by Mercatoni Uno. The last desperate effort. Michele Bartoli was the rider who swung off the front. There's Joe Plankett, Andre Schmil, Wilfred Nelson. These are the riders now in the group. But I think they've missed the boat. Andrea Taffy is still in that group despite all of his hard work today. long straight road they will see these three from road level and Rusin has managed to stretch it out again they've gained four seconds back so the main field is still not coordinated but what a great pursuit this is and I think we're looking at the three who are going to outwit the pack So Fondriest, a great race reader, at one kilometre to go, has read this race right again. He was the only one to reach these two. He may have been aided a little bit by that crash, which threw the concentration of the chase pack. That we will never know. But even so, he read the race right. He's had to work very hard, though, to keep it. A lot of riders now also got their head down there. So the 51st Gent Wevelgem will be remembered for the crash of Steve Bauer and Johan Museo and also a good winner here from one of these three because they've made an extremely good attack. It didn't come on the Kemmelberg, it came on the flat roads running towards Wevelgem. 
No longer does Fondrius want to go through, nor does Lars Mikkelsen. He's a fair finisher, Mikkelsen, but I wouldn't have thought he's as quick as Fondrius, but he's gone anyway. And Mikkelsen's gone an awful long way out. Roosten sat up, he'll get third. But Mikkelsen and Fondrius are coming to the line now. It looks to me as though Mikkelsen has it by about half a length here. And Fondrius now is coming. Fondrius is coming through on the left of our picture. It's going to be close. My goodness me, it was close, but you know, I think Mikkelsen has got that by the width of his tyre. And if he has, that is an unbelievable result for the Danish man. He will be the first ever, and there's the main field in, and Cipollini took that out clearly enough. He'll be fourth. So his Mercatoni Uno boys will kick themselves because the man was banged on form, but they never got him up to the leaders. And the victory has gone to Lars Mikkelsen, I think, of Denmark. And that is Denmark's first ever victory in this event. And he's got a classic under his belt. Seven wins last year, and now he's got a win very early on this year. The Festina rider, the rider on which the world champion Luc Leblanc is a member, but wasn't here today. Let's look at the sprint again. Mikkelsen is the rider on the right. He went very, very early indeed. Took him a while to get that big gear rolling. At this point, he had it won, but then Fondrias seemed to kick so strongly as they start to make a desperate dive for the line. Fondrias starts to claw his way back, and at this point, it did appear as though Fondrias was going to take it. Watch the line. Second in Milan, San Remo, Maurizio Fondrias, and now second here in Gent Wedelgum this year, the eternal second, because Lars Mikkelsen has won the classic Gent Wedelgum. And he's done it at his very first attempt. There's the man who was outwitted because Mario Cipollini had to settle for fourth place. He's had a second before, he's had two wins. Now he'll have to say he was fourth. But this has been an excellent race. Action all of the way. The news reaching us, by the way, is that Steve Bauer is OK. That, uh, in fact, Ballerini has a suspected broken shoulder. That will have to remain to be confirmed. Well, let's uh, speak with Lars Mikkelsen through the voice now of our Belgian commentator who will speak in English. You are the winner and for us it's a big surprise. Yeah, for me, of course, it's, it's a kind of surprise also because it's a, it's a big race. But I've been preparing this race actually because I know in Flandern I was good but it's perhaps just a little bit too early. It's only my second year as a professional and the World Cup is something special. Huh? This is more my level. <laughs> Hij zegt, uh, ik voel me thuis in uh, Vlaanderen, de wereldbeker, dat is me nog een beetje te hoog gegrepen. Dit is uh, meer uh, mijn niveau, hier hoor ik er al bij. As, a, as an amateur, you are also good on the couple stones, so we're used to go full out here in uh, this region, isn't it? Uh, I will not say I've ever been a specialist on cobbles, but I'm not bad, I'm not a specialist, you know, I can progress very much. And Perhaps in some years I can be uh, one of the fairies for Paris-Roubaix. <laughs> well, Paris-Roubaix is the next race he will ride. This was how he did it this time. They rubbed shoulders and then he launched a great finish. But at this point it really did look as though Mauricio Fondriest was going to fight back. Then he lost ground. What a great second kick that Lars Mikkelsen produced here. Very determined ride. In fact, the gear he was riding was 53-11. And he said afterwards he felt it was a little bit high because his legs started to tire by the line. And you can see that happening right now. This line must have seemed a very long way off indeed because Fondriest was coming back. At this point, Fondriest must have felt he had it. For the second uh, time, you have taken a second place in the Classic. But first, did you know about this man? Yes, I knew him, but not very well. He's very fast in the sprint, but I'm also very fast in the sprint. We, we went to the 100 meters to go, and we were together, but he pushed his bike further forward than I did. Those are the words of Fondriest. And there we can see it for ourselves. This was a great sprint. And second place from Maurizio for the second time this year.
And so a first ever win for Denmark in Ghent Wevelgem. Maurizio Fondria second. Luke Rusen five seconds back finished third. Mario Cipollini took fourth at 11 seconds and Giovanni Lombardi was fifth. A great ride by Zbigniew Spruk after that crash. He finished in sixth place. Until we meet again, let's hope on the roads to Paris-Roubaix. I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye.